Welcome everybody uh, <coughs> to a talk on training as a BPA judge. So the main areas I'm looking to cover today is what's involved in the training specifically for becoming an FS judge. I'll tie it into other disciplines where I know the specifics or I may cite feedback from the other judges in the room who may be able to help. Uh, I also want to demystify the judging process a little bit for the competitors. Um, often it's kind of misunderstood or there's an air of mystery around what happens in the judging room. Uh, often there's decisions that are made that affect the competitors and there's maybe not always the understanding as to what goes on behind the scenes. So as a bit of an introduction, my name's Lucy Westgarth for those that don't know me. Uh, I've been jumping since 2010 and probably competing since about 2012. So I've competed across um, FS in four-way and eight-way formation skydiving. Uh, I've done the free fly B category and for those of you who remember the dark old days, the BCPA accuracy disciplines before they brought in any restraints and rules around how many people were out in a pass. But we've survived and here we are. Um, I began training, speed, of course, speed, <laughs> thank you. Also speed skydiving, so uh, a good cross-discipline um, representation there. I began training as a judge at the uh, 2016 Nationals, it would have been, uh, with a little bit of an introduction at the 2016 Indoor World Challenge. Um, for me, it was mostly curiosity that got me involved, so that brings me on to why become a judge. For me, when I was looking at the big boys in formation skydiving, the likes of Hayabusa, uh, Golden Knights at the time, it was always looking at how the judges could actually distinguish between the performance of both teams. When it came down to a tie break at a World Championships or between Wimby and Hayabusa at the World Challenge, if it went to a jump off, when the teams are flying that fast, how can they tell the difference and say with confidence that one team's correct and one team's not? I wanted to learn more about uh, where the busts occur and how I as a competitor could learn from that and apply it to skydiving even at a much lower level than those guys. But um, as some of you may see, there's a collection of Haribo on the table in front of me. The main reason that is there is to encourage a bit of audience participation. So I'm going to be asking some questions during the presentation. Uh, genuine answers are welcomed and will earn you some Haribo. Heckling, if it gets a laugh from the audience, will also earn you some Haribo. So any innuendo, any jokes, any sarcasm thrown in there, if the rest of the audience react, that will earn you some bonus prizes. But I would like to ask the existing judges in the room, there are some of you, why did you get into judging? Any of you. <laughs> Tangfastics or standard? <laughs> oh, there we go. It's why I bought ones in packets and not loose ones, just in case. So out of interest, just to get an idea of the demographics across the room, uh, raise your hand if you're currently a judge. I won't pick on you again, don't worry. Raise your hand if you're a competitor across any discipline. Raise your hand if you're thinking about training to be a judge. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe not in the immediate future, but perhaps at some point in your skydiving career, if that's any more of you. Fair enough. Um, where does that lead me? We've covered why you would become a judge. Uh, now to begin on what happened for me on the judging journey. Uh, with the FS judging in particular, uh, it is or was the biggest nationals in the world, but it's still the biggest nationals in terms of four-way uh, it's the biggest nationals we have across the BPA, across all disciplines. So uh, in the FS judging room, uh, I realised this year a lot of the competitors weren't aware of what went into it from an admin point of view or what the judges went through judging each round. So um, 
for each round that is jumped by the teams, the cameramen bring us the footage. Uh, this applies for four-way and eight-way and VFS as well. Uh, we're allowed three views of the footage. So we'll always watch it once in full speed to count the number of points. If we're still not sure on the number of points after the first view, if say for example, right on the cutoff of 35 seconds, the point might have been in, it might have been not, we'll watch it a second time at normal speed. Or alternatively, we'll watch the second and third at a lower speed. So that could be anywhere between 50 and 70%, depending on the software that we're using. If we're using stopwatch pen and paper, the old school method, which often happens at the UKSLs, uh, in those cases, uh, it'll be whatever the video software will allow us as well. The speed that we rewatch it at, if it's at reduced speed, that will be set as a standard across the whole competition. So if the first reduced speed that we watch is decided to be at 70%, we will do the same for all teams that we watch on reduced speed, uh, just to keep it fair across the board, because often when it comes down to slower speeds, you see more of the frames. A point might be clearer at 50%, but not at 70%. But to keep it fair, that's the way we do it. So there's a maximum of three views that we can use. Sometimes there can be a fourth view, but only if an absolute is called by one of the judges. So if you have a panel of three, two judges might say it's a bust. One judge might be adamant that it's not a bust and they have justification as to why they believe it isn't. Uh, they can call an absolute on that point. In that case, there would be a fourth view and there would have to be a unanimous decision made between the judges. On that fourth view, everything else on the dive becomes irrelevant apart from that one point that's in question. So if it's the 10th point where someone's called an absolute, if all of a sudden someone realizes something's happened on point two, that doesn't matter. You're not allowed to uh, reconsider that point. You're only allowed to look at the specific point on the absolute. Um, and as I say, at that point, there's a unanimous decision made. Uh, the systems can vary from competition to competition, as I've already covered. Uh, the UKSLs, where a lot of my training happened, most of it was uh, with a stopwatch and pen and paper, trying to keep track of... Um, some people use a tick mark system for point, point, point. Some of them will count in their heads and then go, I've got a question on the sixth one and write down the number six. Uh, some drop zones develop their own software. Uh, Langer, for example, have got um, a system where the cameramen will upload and the video will automatically stop after 35 seconds. Uh, whereas Hibbled Store, where they hold the nationals and where sometimes they hold the GP meets as well, they own the in-time system, which is commonly recognized across the board. Uh, that will allow you to mark the points as you go through the competition and clearly mark any busts with justification as to why. <coughs> so what else happens in the judging room? This is where I welcome some suggestions from the board. But, for those of you that have just joined, I did say um, genuine answers would be welcomed, but if there's sarcasm or heckling and it gets a giggle, then you get some sweets as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Any other guesses? I think I heard one from Ruth. Bribery. Attempts at bribery. <laughs> Often in the form of Haribo. Complaints. Complaints. Yes. <laughs> My throwing's getting better as well. It's improving all round. Any other suggestions? Mm. Sometimes. Oh. Tea. Bad weather tea. Bad weather tea. That is true. Although often. Dare I say it, we do sometimes mingle with the competitors during bad weather if we're caught up on video footage. Okay, so uh, the actual points that I've covered in this, um, the lesser known ones are helping to judge the comedy or bonus awards at nationals. So often that will be the best bust, the best funnel, uh, best or worst dressed team, Potter knows what's coming now. Uh, as well as feedback to competitors or coaches. Uh, so the teams that train a bit more and maybe invest in bringing a coach with them to nationals, they'll sometimes 
send their coach or the coach will go of their own accord to find out where the busts have occurred and if it's something they can learn from moving forwards. Uh, we're not allowed alcohol in the judging room, which is why I was so keen for alcohol today. <laughs> uh, we are uh, subject to the same rules as competitors when it comes to competitions uh, under the World Anti-Doping Association. So if random drug testing were to occur, the judges would be um, <coughs> just as potentially tested as the competitors would be. Uh, we'd also have to submit any therapeutic use exemptions for prescription drugs in the same way that competitors would. On the subject of um, bonus awards at nationals, uh, we also contribute to the bar tape, and this was my personal favourite from Nationals last year. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> I tried to talk around. Wes gave me permission, by the way, your cameraman. Blame him if you like. So, this is an example of, <laughs> dare I say it, a team of very competent flyers, but one moment of busting the first point. <laughs> leads to miscommunication across the team and then that snowballs throughout the round. They eventually get back on it. <laughs> so um, the cameraman told me to say that it was all Sam Behman's fault, but uh, I prefer to tell Potter he just didn't get there quick enough. <laughs> Wait for it. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Talk to Wes, blame him. He gave me permission. Uh, so as well, this is the in-time system I was talking about. So you'll see now, this is the scorecard that says uh, what each of the judges awarded it. Uh, it was pretty unanimous across the board on this one. But we thought uh, purely on the basis that it was uh, one mistake, eight way, it's a lot harder to communicate across the team if everything goes out the window slightly. Uh, it's a lot harder to find a reset point as it would be in four-way or VFS when there's less of you there to communicate, put it in the bucket and move on. All right. So what does training as a judge involve? Thank you for the photo, Ruth. Um, apparently, sometimes it involves standing on bar stools to get the best possible view. Uh, occasionally, we will live judge competitions in the wind tunnel. So. For this particular example, if some of the teams uh, flew a little bit higher in the airflow, to be able to see all of the grips, it helped to stand on a chair. Uh, Paul at Bedford wasn't too happy about this, and I don't think the health and safety police were either. Uh, but, you know, still here. Uh, so training as a judge in general, it can vary from discipline to discipline. Welcome, Frank. Uh, for most of the disciplines, they say an average of two years for someone to uh, train through the system to the point where they're a BPA qualified judge. Uh, it can be shorter or longer depending on a few variables. So it depends how well you know the discipline that you're judging. If it's something you've competed in yourself, you will have more background, you'll know the dive pool, you might have suffered many of the busts in the past, which in my case was very much true from several years of scratch teams. We had a lot of busts. Uh, it also depends how many competitions you yourself can attend throughout the year. So for FS and um, CF, I suppose, there's Grand Prix held throughout the year. So you can attend more and more of them. You can build your experience uh, with first-hand uh, coaching from a senior judge. Uh, it also depends how many subcategories there are within that discipline. So with FS, at the moment, there's four-way, eight-way and VFS all within the same rating. There's some discussion at the moment about making an FS light qualification, I suppose, that just looks at the belly aspect, and then uh, VFS as a separate add-on. So someone could become solely VFS or four-way and eight-way, and if they wanted to progress to the international level, they would have to cover all three of those, but it would allow them to judge at the respective nationals. So that's in the pipeline at the minute. We'll see what comes of that. Uh, by comparison, for an artistics judge, free fly and freestyle is generally held at the same weekend. So there are su two subcategories, but they're on at the same time. So it's easy to cover both in the same place. It can also depend on an individual's personality. So I didn't realize at the time that I was being tested by Frank. 
Hi. Uh, by being sent to write the scores up on the board. Uh, Frank came to judge one of the competitions off the back of a night shift and I thought he was just a bit tired uh, and asked me as the trainee to go and write the scores up in front of all of the competitors and as soon as I went downstairs with the pen I realised it was a very daunting situation depending on how tight the competition was, depending how many rounds had happened. People would be crowding waiting to see what the scores were. If busts were being written on the board they were immediately demanding to know why they'd been given busts. Um, in competition, if there's any questions about busts or about the number of points that have been awarded, it should be referred to the chief judge uh, for that particular competition. As a trainee, one of the things that you are being tested on is do you have the discipline and I suppose the integrity to um, stand up to people and say, that's not for me to say, you would have to come and speak to the chief judge, but I can take you to them now. Uh, they'll be able to better explain why this particular situation occurred. We can talk through the footage with you. Sam Bement, this happened at Langer, and it wound you up massively when I wouldn't tell you what happened. <laughs> Sorry again. <laughs> Didn't realise I was being tested, but luckily um, it all went well. Um, there could also be a certain amount of revision. So I posted on Facebook looking for any footage from teams that had been training in VFS and 8-way. Because there'd been the UKSLs and the Hib Cup, I'd had a lot of training on four-way in particular. Uh, but for eight-way, it's a slightly different visual because there's so many more people. It's a new dive pool. VFS, uh, the visibility of the points is so much harder, which we'll cover shortly. Uh, so I did quite a bit of revision at home by asking on Facebook for people to send me footage. Uh, some cameramen, Craig Hicks, were able to give me footage uh, where it was the raw footage from their camera at Nationals the year before, as well as the downloads from InTime, which had their scores on. So I was able to have a go looking at the raw footage to see what I think they should be given uh, with my stopwatch and pen and paper, and then to have a look at what the official scoring was and to see what they were given uh, as a comparison and to test myself at home. So really it depends how much time you're willing to invest, what the discipline is, how many competitions there are, and kind of what your fit is within the discipline, uh, whether you get distracted watching the videos or whether you're able to focus in on the points specifically. Speaking of being able to focus on the points, uh, challenges. For me in particular, um, because there were three different sets of dive pools to learn, it was challenging in the sense that you'd learn a general rule for one that might not apply to the others. So in four-way, how many of you have done some level of four-way? Thank you. Uh, a lot of the shapes are very round, and with four people, it's easy to have a very round shape. So you've got the E's, the Mika's, uh, the J's or donuts, uh, the D's, the Yuan's. I'm getting better at learning the names. <laughs> They're all very round, and the general rule I was taught uh, when looking at people who are flying, whether it's the very fast teams, and they're flying so fast you can't look at all the grips, or the rookie teams where they're smashing together and the shape's a bit irregular. One thing to look out for was, are there any stray limbs in the middle of the formation? If there's an arm or a leg waving in the middle on a four-way, it's probably a bust, and it's an easy one to train your eye in on. So, for example, it's a little bit blurry, but there's a J, it's a donut, it's nice and round, there's no stray limbs. However, when you get to eight-way, that rule goes out the window slightly. And to this day, when I look at L's on this particular shape, I still think something's wrong. I think there should be a person in the middle closing it. And even if it's a very competent team, I still end up looking to see, has someone gone low? Where have they gone? Have they closed it wrong? So there are some false friends there. Um, also, one of the challenges was not getting distracted by technique. So because I was still competing in FS at the time, and still am, uh, I can get very distracted by different teams and how they approach certain dives, how they fly certain blocks. Uh, it's one that I always bring up, but Johnny Flowers flying a 10. He's got incredibly long legs and the amount of power that he puts when turning a block. Uh, for those of you that haven't done a triple A four-way, it's a piece where the tail flyer has a hold of somebody's leg. They pivot around it as a piece of two and then close it again. But because he's got incredibly long limbs, he's so efficient at flying it. 
And it's so easy for me at this stage anyway to get distracted by that and to stop looking at what's happening everywhere else. I'm a little <laughs> He's got a complex about the Johnny Flowers legs. <laughs> <laughs> if it helps, uh, there's a guy in the Golden Knight that is, dare I say it, even better than Johnny Flowers at turning turns. Uh, and he's not particularly tall, so I always thought it was down to Johnny's legs, but it, it is possible amongst the uh, more vertically challenged. <laughs> Challenges also depend on what your starting point is. Are you having to learn the dive pool from scratch? Is it a discipline that's completely alien to you? Uh, for me, I have toyed with the idea of getting into CF judging as well because it's on the same premise of FS, a point is a point or it's not a point. It can be very clear cut as to whether or not you award it. Uh, but I don't know anything about CF, so it would take me a lot longer to learn the dive pool, learn the different ways of taking the points or the grips, if you call it in that in CF, I, I don't know. Uh, so um, your challenges basically depend on what your starting point is. A different challenge for me uh, was VFS. I like watching VFS a lot. I would love to be able to fly at that level. But as you can see here, the cameraman in particular has a particularly difficult job at keeping everything in frame, uh, purely because you have to be able to see all of the grips all at once. So four way, a lot of the time it's been looked down on. It's more 2D, even though people are flying over the top. But VFS, all of a sudden you've got the 3D elements. You have to be able to see all of the grips to be able to award the point. Uh, but also you'll see soon the sun comes into shot. Uh, VFS has the added challenge that if it's a blue sky day, which occasionally happens in the UK, uh, you can be blinded by the sun and the cameraman's feet can often come into the frame because of the angle. So uh, the cameraman will often have to rotate around the formation a lot more, which depending on the speed of the team can Motion sickness is the wrong word, but it's, it's leaning towards it, uh, depending on how good the cameraman is. So the rewards. This was a photo that was shown during the AGM. These are the medal winners from the VFS Nationals. Uh, I just thought this was a particularly nice picture because there were only three teams involved in this one. Uh, but one of the rewards I found as a judge was seeing how the competitors learned from each other during the competition. Uh, how the gold medal winners would look after the uh, second and third place flyers, how they'd teach them uh, particular blocks as they came up in the dive pool if they were particularly difficult. But also across the GPs, it was nice to see teams that maybe really struggled at the first meet to how they progressed across the UKSLs and then internationals as well. So whether they'd really struggled with exits to start with, or maybe the camera person really struggled in particular, it was great to see them progress. And maybe they were just doing the GPs and it was just those jumps that they needed. But with a lot of them, you could see how much investment they'd been putting into the tunnel, into training jumps. And it feels oddly rewarding to have been able to see them progress throughout the system uh, and see how much they can come along in such a short period of time. Uh, tied into that is seeing how much the sport progresses. So if, say, for example, um, Crispy, your BPA record was almost threatened at Dunk as well. There was a very quick draw came up in the VFS dive. And it's seeing the excitement amongst the team saying, it's a quick draw, it's a quick draw we might be able to do this. And as new teams come through, they'll start to push the old averages that were set by teams that came before them. Also, um, there is free BPA membership for judges if they judge a certain amount within that calendar year. So there is an added incentive. I'd like to say we're not paid because it is a volunteer position as it is across the BPA, but expenses are covered if you're traveling to competitions um, and um, staying there for the duration. Tips for competitors. Uh, this is an example of one of the scorecards. So at Nationals, I was talking to one of the teams at the end of the meet, and he was saying how happy he was that they had a very clean meet. For him, that was uh, a goal they'd been working towards. It wasn't the points average, but they wanted to have a relatively clean meet by their standards, which I know a lot of us can relate to. And I said to him, did you have a look at your score sheet? 
uh, because I had judged a few of their rounds. He was like, no, why? Well, we only got two busts. It was a really clean meet. And I was kind of saying, well, if you're looking to carry on, maybe have a look at the score sheets from each competition. And you can see on here, uh, there's one little red mark. That's not to say Claire is a particularly nasty judge that gave that one mark. Often judges will leave a bust in uh, that the other judges don't agree with as a bit of a warning, I suppose, or a heads up that it's maybe not as clean as it possibly could be, or just to say that it was very ambiguous. So if the same round were to be played to the same judges a year later, the decision could go another way. The judges might agree between the three of them at that time that two of us think it's in, one person thinks it's not, but they're willing to accept, yes, it's a judgment call, uh, but that one person might say, I'm gonna leave it on the score sheet so they're aware of it. It wasn't until the national speaking to the competitors that I was made aware of how many people didn't even look at the score sheets. So from the point of view of leaving it on there for the competitors to see, I don't think many people are aware that that's a resource that's available to them. So another way to earn more points. Judges aren't open to bribery in any way, shape or form. It's part of our code of conduct as such. But um, we like Harry Bow, put bluntly. <laughs> and they can be very long days, especially because we're watching each round up to three, maybe four times. By the time the competition's finished, we may still be upstairs for another three to four hours during the competition. Everyone else has several beers in by this point, but we're still in a very stuffy room at Hibblestow watching video footage. So anything to make our day a little bit brighter is much appreciated. There's also two specific techniques you could look at for scoring more points uh, through feedback from the judges. The judges that are in the room aren't going to like me saying one of these. One of the techniques... <laughs> you zoned in now. One of the techniques, now that you know that we can only see the footage three times, is to fly as quickly as possible and as frantically as possible. <laughs> <laughs> because we, we can only watch the footage three times unless an absolute is called. So um, things will occasionally get missed. If there are problems all across the entire dive, sometimes there won't be a firm decision made across the board and things will get missed because we are only human and these limits are set for a reason. Uh, it wouldn't be fair to only watch one team twice and watch another team ten times. So that's, that's one way to go. <laughs> well said. The alternative, which is much preferred, is to fly a nice clean first round and a good example of it. Nice high fives across the teams there. <laughs> so you can see from this footage, the cameraman gets above nice and early so that you can see all of the grips. They're all in frame. The team fly nice and steady apart from an almost, an almost <laughs> moment. But this was their first round at nationals. And you can see as it goes on, everything is nicely in framed. Everything is paced. Everyone comes off the grips at the same time and the points soon start to rack up, especially by eight-way standards. It might not look crazy quick to the people that have only done four-way, uh, but this was a very good score to get, and it set a very good precedent for this team as the nationals went on. So as soon as a team exits the plane, even if you've seen people geeking in the doorway, we do appreciate that, by the way. We like camera geeking, especially not if it's something long. original. Not too long. Don't hose the other teams. There we go. Uh, but you can see there they got a lovely clean score sheet. As soon as they leave the plane, uh, we often forget who the individual team is because we're looking for the points. We're looking for the formations that come up in that dive. But by fleeing, flying nice and clean and slow, it sets a good example. And then when their next round comes up, you might think, oh, this is the lovely clean flying team that we saw before. If a 50, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> if a 50-50 if a decision comes up where it's two judges think it's a bust, one maybe doesn't, 
on the rewatch, if a team's been consistently clean, I'm just saying it may be in the back of the mind that this team is normally clean. It's 50-50. I can't say it's definitely a bust, so we'll give it to them. The judges would prefer everyone to fly lovely and clean, and uh, Project Fly the Dragon was one team that did this. Chimera is another team that often doesn't look like they're flying that fast, but the points tick up as they go through. And the reason it doesn't look fast is because they're flying clean. There's not grips flying everywhere. Kaizen was another team that did that back in the day. Um, God, none of them are there for me to say back in the day. It wasn't that long ago. Uh, but by flying cleaner, it often um, sets a good example, especially in the first round during a competition. So what next? Uh, for anyone who's just got their BPA qualification in judging, it's two years before they can sit their FAI exam. So um, for the exam and the assessments, uh, each person would have to pay for themselves to go, which can be quite expensive. However, the BPA does reimburse you if you're successful in passing. So as a general rule, the BPA would not send you if they were not happy that you were going to pass because of the cost associated with it. it if you get sent to do your FAI assessment, it's generally a sign that there's faith in you, that uh, they believe you can be successful. For me personally, uh, I'd like to see more people at least start looking at the judging process, whether it's just sitting in at one UKSL. If they decide it's not for them, fair enough. Uh, but if more people want to continue, that would be great. I also want to look at artistics in particular. Uh, for me, artistics was one of the more, I suppose, subjective disciplines the, between the competitors and... Maybe not the competitors, but if eight ways on at the same time, a lot of them will look and say, I much preferred that routine. Why did that score lower than the other one? It, I'd like to understand the theory behind it more. I'm sure there, there is some theory. And I, I choose not to believe that it is just the judges picking and choosing who they like. Um, I'd like also to be running more seminars throughout the year. So at one of the UKSLs this year, I did a session on common busts and how to avoid them, which I think was particularly useful for the rookie flyers. Uh, things like grip switching. Uh, during the exit, they didn't realize they'd be allowed to kind of shuffle along the grips to pick up the first point, but they didn't realize they had to completely let go, moving on to the next points before they could pick up the next one. I'd like to continue doing more of that to help demystify the judging process. And hopefully by doing this presentation, it makes the judges more approachable during competitions in case people have any questions, because especially during bad weather, a lot of us are just as bored as you all are drinking tea. And if people have any questions, if they want to review their footage, if they just want to learn more about a particular bust and how it might occur, how they can avoid it, we're more than happy to accept uh, any questions to do with that. I believe, yep, that's the end. Does anyone have any questions in exchange for Haribo? Comments. <laughs> or comments. Another tip for competitors. Um, white jumpsuits and white gloves don't work. And we really, really don't like pink and yellow and green and blue and different colored jumpsuits. Where's Ming? <laughs> <laughs> Ming's notorious jumpsuit yeah. from three years ago. It's in the tunnel. It looks nice. White works. That's mm -hmm. Yeah, black. But then with black gloves, maybe. Yeah. So it's have a contrasting gloves and jumpsuit kind of thing. That is true. We see a lot of people as well where they might... Yeah. <laughs> the flashing <laughs> shoes. If anyone's coming to the Gold Challenge and wants to pop into the judging room, who um, comes to the Um, you just want to ask the weatherman if, if you can't see, do you have to repeat it, or does the, does the judge decide whether the jump gets repeated or rejected? So often at an individual drop zone, the rules regarding weather will be outlined at the beginning of the competition. So if uh, the weather is not suitable, the plane ordinarily would not be sent. Sometimes the chief instructor will send the plane and say the weather is incremental. 
you exit the aircraft at your own risk. Um, by uh, ops manual rules, you should be able to see the landing area when you exit the aircraft, but we know despite that, sometimes you will end up going through cloud. The judges will make a decision based on the footage, or the chief judge will make a decision as to whether or not the footage is visible or not in which case uh, there may be busts for NV not visible or a rejump may be awarded depending on the circumstances. We are machines. Uh, there will be uh, breaks that are allocated. Uh, they're normally 10 to 15 minute breaks. Uh, it's harder if it's a wind tunnel meet because the tunnel is constantly running. During an outdoor competition, there are normally natural pauses where weather holds occur. But if it is a glorious blue sky day, uh, we will take a break every, would you say, hour and a half, hour. two hours? Yeah, hour. 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 Oh, okay. Hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it depends how many teams there are competing at that. Liz? Potentially. Maybe it's going to be like stickers in your logbook. It's going to be, got to catch them all. But <laughs> wingsuiting is new to me, but uh, Netherhaven is my nearest drop zone. So if they're continuing to hold any meets, I'm also regularly at Hibbledstow and Wingsuit Nationals is there this year. So it might be something I stick my head in at. My main focus for this year is going to be artistics because it's something I've competed in. I still do a lot of free flying in the tunnel. So there is a bit of personal interest there, but uh, I definitely wouldn't strike wingsuiting off the list. Once you've put your name forward to become a trainee judge, what are the next steps that happen after that? So you'd uh, give your availability for any upcoming competitions, or if it's a discipline where there aren't many competitions during the year, but there might be road shows, there might be uh, some space for you to attend that. As a trainee judge, you'd also still have your expenses covered as well. So. Um, if it's as a bit of a trial session and you're at the drop zone anyway, probably not. But uh, if it's something that you do have a genuine interest in, the route to go down would be to email the judges coordinator. And I believe the email address is on the BPA website. Or Helen at the office. Or Helen in the office. That they would be your next steps. And then the judges, uh, whoever judges in that particular discipline would reach out to you from there. <laughs> and you can also sign up um, to the Rise Up and get a mentor through that as well if you want um, extra information. I've not been awarding sweeties, sorry. <laughs> Who else asked a question? <laughs> oh, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> It depends day by day. So was it the Hib Cup that was a particularly beautiful weekend? Uh, blue sky, nil winds. Uh, we were getting through the rounds fairly quickly because the cameramen were very efficient. The teams that were there were flying quite clean. So, and we were awesome. So uh, we had a bit of time between rounds to stand around outside, around the Cooper pad. Glorious sunshine on days like that. Uh, I do miss it, but a lot of the time when it's nationals, the weather's maybe a little bit borderline. I'd maybe sit there and go, 
yeah, pretty glad, pretty glad I've not signed up this year. But for me, it was kind of about, yeah, marking certain events and then committing to the decision I made, regardless of what the weather was. So last year, I was still competing in speed. So I had year marked weekends for doing that. Uh, I'd have year marked weekends for tunnel and then judging one specifically because uh, for me, the aim was to get qualified in that particular year. Uh, this year, I might not do as many events or I might, depending on how my calendar fills up. Uh, so uh, for me, it was all about kind of setting limits around each weekend and focus on what I've aimed to do over that time scale. Yes. If uh, you've kind of given some kind of proven commitment, if you've traveled specifically to train, then yes, the BPA will cover your expenses as well. Yes? Yeah, they'll cover it if it's been pre-agreed. You can't just decide yes. you want to go to 10 competitions. Yeah. Um, and it's also a contribution to your expenses. It's not necessarily for the amount of potential, how much your accommodation is, etc. There's a separate Raph? Yes. <laughs> uh, I was quite fast being a judge, but I have no interest in uh, judging DFS whatsoever. I just like to judge DFS. But as I understand it, to be an FS judge, you have to learn DFS and be able to judge it. Which is a little bit like telling your history teacher you want to study the First World War and being like forced to memorize the Tudor Kings or something like that. It's like, it's not necessarily the subject, so I just ask to study. A little bit. So the so, uh, my, my question is, is the requirement cascading upon you by the FAI? Is that something that's, that we cannot change, given that the VFS events have now been split off and are essentially their own thing? Is that something we should be looking at changing, or is it we all? It's something we're looking at changing at the moment. So the BPA requirements generally cascade down from the FAI, uh, generally because the BPA judges are probably some of the best qualified out there at a national level. Um, I was going to say it sounds like blowing our own trumpet, but from example, I turned up to Belgian indoor nationals and ended up judging the event as well as competing because they were short on judges and a lot of the time they took my word as law, which scared me a little bit, but that was the situation we were in. Uh, the BPA judges are well respected globally because uh, a lot of countries know the BPA train them to a high standard. So often it mirrors the FEI process. However, with FS in particular, because throughout this year there was quite a lot of interest in four-way and eight-way specifically, but not VFS, it has been discussed about breaking it down at a BPA level and then uh, with the stipulation that if it were if that individual wanted to progress to an FAI level, they would then have to do the VFS okay. or vice versa. So the FAI requirement would be an FAI for Yeah. Or an Yes. Elliot? What's your favourite type of paradise? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> 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 Is it tank plastic, straws, or something else? <laughs> If it was a general bag, I'd say Tang Fastics, but I do quite like the fried eggs. <laughs> and cakes are good too. Homemade cakes. Oh, yeah. bonus points for homemade. Chocolate. Not actual points, as I say, when I open to bribery. <laughs> <laughs> but just for an extra warm smile in the bar later in the night, homemade cakes. <laughs> If anything, I'd say if you guys can help to spread the word that we are approachable. If we're in the judging room, if we're still going through footage, uh, please knock if someone wants to come in because we might be in the middle of a round. If we don't, if we don't immediately respond, then it's probably because we are in the middle of a round. Uh, but if the door's open, come on in. If you see us on the drop zone, please don't be offended if you approach someone to ask them about a particular bust or how to fly a certain block. Uh, don't be offended if that person then says, I can't help you in this instance, but I can refer you to the chief judge. 
they will do their best to get the answers for you, but that individual, such as a trainee judge, might not be able to give you that answer. But they may also be able to hand you their Bible of all of the rules and be able to refer you to the right section if it's a more general question. So please do put the word out that we welcome competitors. But we, we wouldn't do it if we didn't enjoy it at the end of the day. It might take us a week or so if it's during outside of competition time, during our own personal lives. People may have work commitments. It may take a little while to get a response, but I'm pretty sure, especially out of everyone that's in this room, we'd be more than happy to help if you get in touch. That's brilliant. One, one question. Yes. Last year, I was videoing, uh, there was a problem with the computer, they lost the team members. It was closed, the judging room was closed, and I had to knock on the door, and I, I couldn't hear if they said yes or no. So I opened the door, and luckily they weren't judging at that particular time, and I needed help. They, they sort of able to refer me to the technical help that I needed, but it was, that, was, that was one time last year. It happened once. It was, it was quite, quite bad. Okay, that's I, felt, I felt really bad for the technical problem with the hosts. Then maybe that's something we need to look at in future years to be able to cater to the deaf community in skydiving as well. Uh, unfortunately, uh, knocking on a door and having to wait for an answer is a little bit of an old school method compared to how skydiving as a sport has come along. Uh, we maybe need to look at other options. Uh, especially at a lot of drop zones we're in classrooms that are out of the way of tannoy's reach as well so unfortunately that does often play a factor a lot of the time we don't realize we're on a weather hold when we are things like that uh, but that's maybe something we need to look at in future anybody else nope oh thanks um it's more curiosity things so I, I, I probably asked a few times i'm not sure about the answer do the judges prefer the formation to stay static relative to the frame? Or, <laughs> <laughs> or would the rather the camera guy stay static relative to the ground, let the formation rotate in the shot? Ground. Hmm? So stay static to the ground. Yeah, if it's seasick off the ground, everyone. Choosing was a good example of not staying at all. Yes, that's true. Don't worry, mate, I've got a sick flying yet. <laughs> <laughs> Although when it comes to 8-way, which I know you are involved with Hicks, some of the shapes can change a lot in dimension. So if you really strongly feel it's important in terms of visibility of the grips, then if it's the odd 90 degree turn, please don't feel that we'll hate you if you do that. Well, there's sort of a little element of sort of dirt diving with the larger formations and the way you be for the framing, so you do have to move. And it's just no whether or not you just dislike that a lot at the point where it's not worth doing it and just finding a different way of filming it. The camera guys are spinning. <laughs> well, it, it is true if it's a very low resolution camera as well. So um, we appreciate a lot of camera people are training. Um, one thing I noticed this year at the UKSLs is that uh, some people were still using fairly old cameras that I did have some experience with and I was able to identify that's a CX-115. They've not put the steady, or they've got the steady shot on when they should have it off and I was able to speak to the teams. Uh, but if there's any kind of questions about the camera work at those particular meets, the um, more experienced teams are often more than willing to help with that as well. So we may be able to, if you come to us and say, um, we've heard our footage is a bit shaky or was the footage okay and we give some feedback, uh, we can probably point you in the direction of someone that's able to give you more technical guidance as well. Such as Hicks. Such as Hicks. <laughs> Sorry, Hicks. All right. Well, if anyone didn't get any Haribo, feel free. There's still some left on the table. But um, yep, I think that's us out of time. Thank you very much.